My name is Jennifer Gilbreth and I work for the Nature Conservancy and we're here tonight to celebrate a book and it's an older book but it has new life and that's why we're here to celebrate. Um, it's a book about Nags Head Woods but it's not about the trees and the ponds and the birds and the wildlife, it's actually about the people. So that makes it pretty unique. Over 30 years ago, the Nature Conservancy got a couple of grants from the North Carolina Humanities Council and from our own Outer Banks Community Foundation to do an oral history of the people who lived in the woods and their descendants. So I'm assuming there's probably a lot of those descendants of the descendants here with us tonight and that was really the purpose and also make sure anybody interested in Outer Banks history would be able to share in the celebration with us. Next Head Woods resident uh, Sylvia Culpepper actually gave the title to the book. You were just talking about how you had, and thinking about the woods community that you had, it had reminded you of a Bible verse. Could, uh -huh. you, could you tell me that again? Okay, and and everyone helped his neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, "Be of good courage." It was in the Old Testament, and it didn't sound like the Old Testament. That's why it always stuck by me. It sounded like it should be in the New Testament. Yeah. I don't know why to me, though, it, you know, the Old Testament was kind of hard to understand. But this being in there, it's in Isaiah. Hmm. I, it, uh, I just noticed it a lot, mm -hmm. and always thought a lot about it. Everyone helped his neighbor, and that's the way we did, and just like now. They will have more people to go, and they will have more food, and more, well, you see, we had our own people, and then the, we called them the city people. They came down and joined, and as I said, they were just as friendly and treated us just like they were. And we really felt a little, uh, they don't do it now as much. Mm -hmm. They sort of think you're, I don't know. Don't know how to read or something, but not. But then they did. They they lo loved the people in the woods. Mm -hmm. The people that came from Edenton, Hertford, Alaska City, and all the places. That was in the that was most of where first night said that's where they first came from. Mm -hmm. But there were some right wealthy people there, mm -hmm. and uh, they just loved all of us mm -hmm. and just thought we were wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they did, and we loved them too. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. We were just like one big family, and everybody, like I said, we all mm -hmm. and wanted wanted good for everybody. There wasn't any greed or any jealousy or anything like that going on. Mm -hmm. There's so much of that now that it's awful. Mm -hmm. But then there wasn't. Everybody wanted his neighbor to was glad of anything good that happened to your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And these we old people left over, we still are. <laughs> but so many people come in now that we don't know. The news started about a year ago when Mary Quidley with the town of Kill Devil Hills called me out of the blue and said, hey Jennifer, I need a copy of that book, you know, the one about the people that live back in Nags Head Woods. And I started looking around and we didn't have any more. And I started looking around on Amazon and there weren't any there. And I looked on Barnes and Noble and there weren't any there. And I looked on eBay and of course there was one there for $50 and it was the only one that I could find so we got it so that we would have at least one but I thought other people might want to see new life in this book so that's how the journey began. I can actually spell the word publish but that's all I know about publishing. I'm a pretty good speller, but I know absolutely nothing about publishing books. So it was um, a very thankful situation. I got in contact with UNC Scholarly Press, 
and they were very supportive. John McLeod in particular, who wanted to be here tonight, uh, got really excited about the project and took it on and, and, and saw it through to the new version that it is today. He had great ideas and um, just really made me feel like I was giving him a gift by giving his department this material to learn about again and, and um, get new information about. So many, many thanks to, um, to John. Uh, also, of course, to UNC, which both of these ladies have ties to, so go heels in general. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, <laughs> we'll have to have another evening event on that. Uh, I also don't know much about book signings, it turns out, either. Um, so Jamie Anderson with Downtown Books also graciously took my call and had great ideas and was uh, really supportive about the project. Um, as most of you know, books are for sale this evening um, and there will be time after for book signing as well. I expect the program will last maybe about an hour and there might still be some signed copies if you can't stay the whole time and still um, want to get a signed copy. So Jamie's store and Nags Head Woods wouldn't really have been big enough to house this event. So definitely big thanks to Wave Riders for, for having us. Um, and congratulations on being open. The place looks gorgeous. Um, we are exceptionally fortunate tonight to have with us both authors of the book, Dr. Luann Jones and Amy Glass. Um, they did the oral interviews with the residents and the descendants of the woods, and from those interviews, the book was written. We're just so happy, and we thank you for being here to celebrate the new life into the older book. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Luann Jones and Amy Glass. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think this crowd is um, probably about three times as big as we could have imagined. So um, we appreciate you coming out this evening so much. Um, we are so grateful that the book has new life. You're always a little worried when somebody sends you an email that begins with, are you the Luann Jones who? And fortunately, it was wrote this book in 19, uh, co-authored this book in 1987. And so the happy second life of this book began uh, about February of this year. Uh, Amy and I always thought this book had legs, and, and indeed it does. I think this is a rare occasion that that the book gets a second life like this. We are so thrilled to meet descendants of descendants. Um, it is a real honor and a privilege. And I think that um, even though uh, hearing Sylvia Culpepper could might have had to strain a little bit, just starting out with that voice reminds us of what a privilege it is to do the oral history interviews and what a privilege it was to do the oral history interviews 32 years ago now. Um, and just to have the opportunity to meet people and to help them tell their stories. And at heart, that's really what we do as oral historians. And then to make sure that those stories are going to be preserved and are going to be shared with other people. I want to make just two quick points um, before we get into the voices because that's what we really want to honor tonight is the voices of the people that we interview. Uh, first of all, we are so grateful that 30 some years ago the Nature Conservancy the um, Next Head uh, Community Foundation, the Outer Banks Community Foundation, and the North Carolina Humanities Council had the foresight to sponsor this project. Um, it really was at a moment where if we hadn't talked to those particular people, that particular generation then, we would have been too late very soon. And I mean, these are really people who had a connection to the late 19th century and who in their lifetimes had seen enormous changes in the Outer Banks. I would say probably even more than those of us in this room have seen in our lifetimes perhaps and going from you know, mules and carts to automobiles and airplanes and all of that, just the rapid transformation in the early 20th century. So um, 
it was very important to do this project then. And there were other places that were doing similar projects at this time. So oral history was very rich in the 1980s. It continues to be. And uh, out of UNC Chapel Hill Southern Oral History Program, a very much community-based uh, oral history program there. So we're very grateful. Um, I think also one of the things that we realized when we started this project and as we did this project, well, this, this was really one of the first times, believe it or not, the historians had really listened to people of the Outer Banks. There were books that had been written, but often by outsiders. Uh, they often told uh, fantastic tales about the Outer Banks, more folklore and mythology. But um, when we talked to people in Nags Head Woods, they told very different kinds of stories than those books told. Uh, they didn't talk about pirates. They didn't talk about ghosts. They talked about family. They talked about community. They talked about work. They talked about worship. They talked about how they had fun. And that's really important that the people from the Outer Banks got to speak for themselves and to represent their community. That was hugely important. And one of the things that Sylvia Culpepper hinted at is that you know, there was some, uh, you know, some people had ideas of those quaint bankers, you know, their brogue, their you know, accents, the way they did things. And so it was a, uh, you know, there was some defensiveness here. Um, and, and we gave them a chance to say, we're proud, this is our way of life. And here's what we have to say about our community. And I think that um, since then, there have been other historians, uh, David Soselsky, who's just a wonderful historian of coastal North Carolina, who wrote our new forward, is one of the new generation of historians of the coastal North Carolina, Bland Simpson, and others. Um, but that was a really important um, point, I think. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, and I don't think we, we knew um, that we were breaking that kind of ground, but, but we're very proud of that uh, contribution. So we are going to let uh, share with you some of the voices. We're going to do some reading of some of these stories and also we'll be playing some clips uh, at the end. But um, in many ways um, here we let the land speak through the voices of the people in the Outer Banks. So Amy is going to take it from here. Thank you, Luann. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here this evening and um, Huge thanks to Jennifer for uh, pursuing this project. It's been an absolute thrill and delight for me. Uh, my career path took me in a different direction. Um, I didn't c pursue uh, history as a as a career. So for me, this is this really encapsulates a moment in time where I very much was um, embedded here uh, in the community, doing the interviews with Luann and getting to to know and meet so many of your um, uh, uh, relatives and, um, and friends. And um, it's just an absolute delight to be here and I'm, I feel very honored and thankful. Um, uh, you'll see in the book that we've written a, an afterword and um, it, several things occurred to us when, we, when the pr project was presented to us and one of the first, um, as Luann just alluded to, um, had to do with, of course, the place, the land and the geography of this place and how unique the stories are because of the place. And so, um, uh, so as we wrote in the afterward, um, lives are shaped by the physical geography of our places of birth and how vividly connected the island residents of Nags Head Woods were to forest, sound, and sea. Livelihoods and pastimes depended on and were given purpose by location, um, a fact that is present in almost every reflection that was shared with us. These stories could only have happened here and through them, the land and the water protected by the, by the ecological preserve speak to us. The landscape itself resurrected memories. We recall how Esther Tillam, Tillett Beecham shyly offered us her hand-drawn map of the Woods community as she remembered it. And you'll see in the book the vivid description of her memory uh, down to the roses that her grandmother uh, had planted. Um, and when we asked her, could you draw that? She 
she did. And um, the, the map, as you know, is, <laughs> is the cover of the book. And um, you know, it includes homesteads, schools, churches, ponds, and dunes. And just this evening, um, I think, I don't want to get the name wrong, but Della, I think, uh, identified that one of the houses is still standing and identified it as uh, number 18 on the, on the map. So um, it's very exciting to, to think about that the place and the location. Um, I wanted to share with you um, the, let me find my number here, um, a little bit more about um, something Luann mentioned, and that also has to do with place, which is the the houses in the woods and the houses and the way that the houses were built and situated in the woods um, and how important it was and, and, and how much pride it brought to the, the folks we spoke with um, to identify the fact that the houses were, were safe. They were safe from harm. They were safe from high tides. They were safe from the, the beachfront. They weren't exposed. Um, so Leland Tillett told us how every high lump that's in Nags Head Woods had been built on at one time or another. They lived on high ridges all over the place. Uh, Evelyn Gray's family had a two-story house with a porch all around. It was up on a hill, but you could look out and see the sound. Uh, Esther Beecham's house was also on top of a rise, and houses were built from timber cut from the woods or sometimes scavenged from shipwrecks. Leland Tillett recalled, they didn't bother to cut the timber down because it was already cut down. An old ship would drift up, and they'd go on board there and tear part of the decking out or the sills, take the old masts, carry them to the mills, and have them sawed. So, um, you know, that they, were, they were scrappy. They were scrappy people. They used their resources well. Um, uh, Sylvia Culpepper told us about all the, the uh, storm blinds and how the storm blinds were so helpful. We'd pull them down and hook them. And they were nice. They shaded your house. When it rained, it didn't rain right in. They were painted dark green. We propped them out in the summer, and in a storm, you'd close them. And most of the houses were what you call a hip roof house. That's a house that has four roofs to it. They would stand a storm better than anything else. Um, so that really gives you a sense of the place. Um, I wanted to share with you, um, Jennifer reminded us of a, a beautiful letter that we received from Vandelia Tillett Brown, um, who at the time was age 80. Uh, and living in Zebulon, North Carolina, when she wrote this letter to us. She was the youngest of the Tillman and Harriet and T Tillett family, and Marshall Tillett's younger sister. Um, she describes scavenging in the woods for all kinds of things that grew there, um, and, and hunting in the woods. So she, uh, as she says, we had lots of fowl. Um, many nights, her father and her brother would come in brothers would come in with 12 or 15 geese to be dressed. And oh, how we dreaded this feather picking spell, <laughs> she said. We had lots of fowl, such as geese, swan, brant ducks, and all kinds of birds. Rabbits, squirrels, coons, and possums, as far as I know, no deer or bear at that time. Uh, we had all kinds of fish and shell food. Wild foods like huckleberries, blackberries, wild grapes, nuts, such as hickory nuts, walnuts, acorns, and chinkapins. We had to buy very few groceries, only sugar, flour, meal, coffee, tea, salt, and pepper. We also had plenty of chickens and eggs. And I particularly love this description of um, how we had no freezer or refrigerator, if you can imagine that, only a homemade ice box. My dad made that, and it held a half a block of ice, and it served us nicely. We made lots of milkshakes and lemonade. We did not know about Cokes or Pepsis at that time, but we found the milk and lemonade just as refreshing. So they really paint um, a beautiful and vivid picture of the place. And um, so I did want to share those, those uh, with you. Um, we're kind of going by chapters in the book. And um, the next chapter in the book, past the settings, is Kith and Kin. And um, several of our narrators told us that 
<clears throat> as in most rural communities during the earliest, early 20th century, neighbors were often likely to be related. And Norris Austin explained to us, everybody was more or less kin, particularly up in the north end where my grandparents were. There was granddaddy's stretch of land and his father's was below. Going north was sister Penelope Baum and then Florence Partridge and right on up the road. Everybody was kin all up and down the road although it was maybe five or six miles that the community was stretched out. And large families were common. Vandelia Brown and her brother Marshall grew up in a family with 10 children. So did Evelyn Wise Gray, Boone Tillett, and his sister Evelyn Beach, Esther Beecham, excuse me, together with their six sisters and four brothers comprised the family of Maggie L. and Herb Tillett. My family, said Mrs. Beecham, was a village in itself. <laughs> Um, I, I particularly enjoyed uh, the descriptions of holidays and festive times, informal times, times at church. Um, but this one particular um, a comment about Christmas I thought was a lot of fun. Uh, oh, we thought it was wonderful. We'd hang up our stockings. We'd get an apple and an orange, two or three pieces of candy. And one time I got a little chicken on wheels. Oh, I thought I was rich. We had holly and mistletoe. We'd go out in the woods and get that, decorate the house. We had a goose. There was always plenty of fowl, goose, and ducks to eat. And lastly, um, in this section, I just wanted to share with you um, some of the um, sadder side, um, but again, the community around uh, death and burial. And Vendelia Brown described how the woods community took care of its own. Our neighborhood helped each other in times of distress. We found love and concern in sickness and death. We had no access to undertakers in those days and my daddy was called to help out. He even made caskets. Mother padded and covered them in white material to look very nice. And many times I made flower wreaths of cardboard covered with evergreens, mostly cedar and mums or any flowers available. That was my contribution to help. My dad had a special cart he used to take bodies to the graves on. He usually dressed the men and mother did the women and children. As compared to today, it was very simple. Some of our laymen would read the Bible and pray and three or four women would sing a song or two. And that was our burial service. This is the best we could do in our situation and it was appreciated by the families who were our neighbors and friends. And this was all done free. Nobody had to worry about the bill like today. I'm going to pass this on to Luann to okay. share some other aspects. Yeah. So the next chapter is about workings. And so, of course, in this, for this generation, work was at the center of their lives. I think a couple of things to note is that for the, probably the um, parents of the people we talked to, that they had a variety of ways to make a living. So there was no one way usually that they earned their income. They would do some farming, they would do some fishing, uh, they might do some carpentry work, women might um, even clean houses for example, or do some kind of work for the um, summer visitors, and so there were a variety of ways that people would be bringing in income. And of course children too were expected to help on the farm, or uh, there's a delightful story in there from Evelyn Wise Gray about peddling crabs, and she was quite a <laughs> quite a, a crabber, and uh, at one point even sold enough crabs to buy a little organ. So she was um, she was something else. So again, everybody contributed to the family income. Um, I think uh, one of the th things again, there was such hard work. And one of the descriptions from Esther Beecham talking about her mother, uh, Maggie Tillett, uh, here's just, uh, she said that Maggie Tillett was an industrious woman who was always busy. So this was her day. She milked three cows, she hauled cow manure to her cherished flower garden, she raised chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese, sewed quilts and curtains spun yarn and knitted socks and plowed the garden if she had to. Ms. Beecham said her mother did, quote, whatever needed to be done, 
she worked constantly and she was so tired some nights she didn't even want to take a bath. Some afternoons she would ask me to draw a pan of water for her to soak her feet in. So that's tired. I think a couple of the stories that were shared with us really um, dealt with fishing though. And I'm going to read a couple of these uh, short excerpts that we featured. Uh, the first one is we called the Twilight Hall and this is from Sylvia Culpepper. And she remembered watching her husband Hal and his family fishing on the shore. They would go fishing early in the morning and also make the twilight haul. That's about dark. On the beach, on the ocean, that was just beautiful. In October, it was out of this world. We'd go down and make bonfires. It was getting chilly, and they'd fish. It would be just about dark. All the families would go down there, and the moon would be coming up. It was beautiful. October. It's always been my favorite time at the beach. They'd make an early haul in the morning and then a twilight haul. But Mr. Culpepper, Hal's daddy, he'd say, we got to make that twilight haul. And he had five sons and they all worked with them. They used a dory. They'd go out and set the net. I used to help them pick the fish out of the nets. They'd get a load of fish and they said on a moonshiny night that they would spoil. Now you could believe that. I've heard it and we did it. If the moon was shining that night, they said, we've got to get those fish out of the nets before morning. They catch spot. I've seen that net so full, full they look like eggs packed in there. Every mesh had a spot in it. And they'd stick in your hands and everything else. But boy, we get to work. We get those things out. They pull the net right up on shore. It lays right there and you pick the fish out. Then they cleaned the net out, and the next morning they set it again. Uh, and another story, we called it uh, Counting the Waves, and I was thinking about the story. I was trying to count the waves today when I was out on the beach. I wasn't very good at it. But this comes from um, Boone Tillett and about learning how to read the ocean in order to time the launch of a boat. There were days, maybe a week, when you couldn't go out to sea. The seas were so rough. Now I've been out lots of times with my father, and he'd stand there and count the waves. One, two, three, and then somewhere around eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 would be a little one. And he'd start over again. One, two, three, and if the twelfth one, let's say, the next time was little two, then that was a pattern, don't you know? So he'd do that for half an hour, maybe more. He would stand there right in the surf with the boat and all ready to go. Whenever he started that series, when the eleventh wave would come, or the twelfth, or whichever one he decided on, they went. Whether it was big or little, they went. They had two men in the boat with oars, and then one man, the captain, was standing at the stern of the boat, and he'd push her off in the water. Those men would start with those oars, and they'd go right on over those waves. I've done that many a time. One of the topics that we did talk about was transportation, and certainly in this part of the world, transportation has played a huge part in the way uh, people got to the Outer Banks and the, the very development of the Outer Banks. Um, and so the coming of bridges and, and all of those, the automobile, uh, changed the way of life here dramatically. But one of the things that became very clear to us was that the Outer Banks people had never been isolated. And that was, I think, one of those kind of ideas that had grown up around the Outer Bankers, again, to make them seem remote and quaint and whatever, um, that we discovered just wasn't true. And I'm sure many of you here know that in a maritime world, you can get lots of places on a boat that you can't get in a car, or at that point, a horse and cart. And it occurred 
occurred to me, I mean, I grew up not, this, not so far from here in rural Gates County, North Carolina, and I thought, oh my gosh, the people here went a lot further than any of my people ever went because my people were traveling over roads and they weren't, didn't have access to, to skiffs and to other larger um, boats that could get out into the Atlantic and go as far as New York and, and points in between. So I think that that was one of, again, our contributions to say these people were not isolated. They were really cosmopolitan people who had, had access to a, a wide world. Um, after all, the English did come to Roanoke Island in the late 16th century, so this part of the, the, part of the planet's been part of a, a global economy for a long, long time. Um, so anyway, I think that that was one of the things that we, um, that we felt like we were contributing here. So as Leland Tillett to told it, he said, um, he he had done a lot of research on his family back to the 18th century, and he said his woods ancestors, quote, traveled more than we ever knew. They had three or four ships. They knew more about the hurricane seasons and the winds than we'll ever know. They were smart enough that they didn't go out of Roanoke Inlet if they were going to Norfolk. They'd go 50 miles on up on the inside, go out the Currituck Inlet, dodge back in there and go up to Norfolk. They didn't travel 100 miles outside. They had more sense than that. Um, and uh, also one of the um, comments that Nor um, Norris Austin made was that um, his grandmother, Maggie Tillett, he said he could remember her hopping in her boat for a trip that was, that was as commonplace as hopping into a car to run errands was, is today. She had a shove skiff that she kept up in the creek. Uh, Nora said, I've seen her once or twice go down and shove her boat out to the head of the creek and set her nets. And people talked about going from the woods to Mandio, Wanchies. Elizabeth steamers were coming here from Elizabeth City all the time. So this was a world that was very connected. But again, of course, with the coming of the bridges, the coming of the automobile, um, this place was ripe for development. And so it's not until those changes in transportation occur that we begin to see uh, in the post-World War II era, uh, the beginning of the development of the of this area that I think was really picking up by the 1970s and the 1980s as we were beginning to do this project. So, so Amy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Um, so we did a, a very brief chapter on um, sickness and health. We heard so many stories about home remedies that we just had to find a place in the book where we could just collect all of these wonderful ideas. And now, of course, we go running to the doctor and we go running to the drugstore for any little thing. But it wasn't so easy for the Woods residents to do that. And of course, they had at their disposal all kinds of roots and berries and uh, things that they grew and things that they collected. And so, and so medical care was, sure, there were doctors available in Mantio um, and other places, but there were a lot of, um, uh, of cures right at hand. Um, and some of the more interesting ones that we heard about I'd like to share with you. Um, so um, Esther, Esther Beecham, who is one of our, our narrators, said, people are always running to the doctor now for things that just healed themselves then. In Texie Tillett Meekin's family, we would go, go on to the doctor if it was necessary, but we didn't run to one for every little thing, and that was a theme that we heard again and again. Um, Evelyn Wise Gray tells us that we would ramble the woods, dig up sassafras, take it home and make tea that purifies your blood in the spring. We had to take a spoonful of sulfur and molasses every morning. I hated that stuff. That was also to purify your blood. Um, this one I thought was very unique. Um, this is a remedy for freckles. I didn't know that freckles were needed a remedy. Uh, but uh, Boone Tillett it talked about how his sisters would find a big old grapevine in the spring when the sap was coming up, cut a grapevine about six or eight feet from the ground, pull it over, and tie it down to something. 
it would fill up it would fill up a fruit jar overnight <laughs> and that was supposed to take the freckles off <laughs> and, he, and then he finished that up by saying it didn't it didn't help him any it didn't even didn't hurt hurt him either <laughs> um, now here's something coming right out of the vegetable garden if Texi Meekins had a fever her grandmother would go out and get a big cabbage leaf out of the garden and cool it with well water. Then she'd cut up some onions and stuff, <laughs> put some herbs in it, and bind it under your arms. That was supposed to take the fever down. At least she thought it would. <laughs> and then I just love this line, we went to the doctor only if you were just about dead. <laughs> Um, as you can imagine, childbirth in the woods was, was a, a complicated thing. Um, and that also involved a, tr a mixture of traditional um, and modern medicine. Um, well into the 20th century, midwives were central to the care of mothers and newborns. And we heard the names of many midwives. Um, Aunt Patty Tillett, Polly Tillett, Aunt Maeve Moore, Lula Mann, and Mary Ann Beasley. These women served Nags Head Woods and also the neighboring communities of Manteo, Collington, and Kitty Hawk. Um, and they would often uh, not, not only be there to attend the birth, but then stay with the mother uh, before leading up to the birth and even after the birth to help with the newborn um, and help with the family. So those were some of the um, more interesting passages. Um, and I think that there is even a tape uh, that Jennifer has of, of a home remedy that you'll hear yeah. in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So one, uh, one uh, of the final, uh, the latter chapters was about having fun uh, because even though people spend a lot of time working, they also spent some time playing. Um, and again, as Amy was talking about with medicine, well, there was homemade, homemade, home remedies as well as professional doctors, so it was with entertainment. So there was a lot of homemade music and people who would just um, visit with family and friends as part of their entertainment. Uh, so there were ways of, of kind of taking care of that themselves. Um, but there were also uh, more and more commercial forms of entertainment that were introduced into people's lives. Um, and for example, and this had been going on for a while, the steamers that came in. So the steamers that would come in to Nags Head Woods uh, uh, on the weekends, when the visitors got off the steamers and uh, came into uh, went over to the beach the kids in Nags Head Woods would get on the steamers and play on them all day long and th think that was their great playground for a while so Boone Tillett recalled of the Sunday steamers he said when we were little boys we used to go down to the steamer the Hattie Creek the people would walk up the pier and to the store and to their cottages we would walk under the pier in case somebody dropped a nickel or a dime and we would find them we would go up up to Aunt Maeve Moore's and had her tell our fortune, give her a nickel to tell our fortune. Oh, she'd tell us that what great men we were going to be. <laughs> so, and um, one of the, this is the last excerpt I'm going to read. Again, this comes from Sylvia Culpepper, who was um, a great storyteller. Um, so, you know, of course, the dance, dancing, the casino, and other pavilions were uh, came onto Nagsy Woods. So that kind of dancing, and she loved to dance. And so, um, one of the places that she would go for dancing was the Coast Guard station. So this is about what happened at the Coast Guard station. Um, she said, we had a lot of dances at the Coast Guard stations. Oh, that was the best of all. You'd see people from other places. All these Coast Guard men did the Coast Guard swing, we called it. It was different from anything you ever saw. Instead of dancing, they took you right across the floor and right back again. I'm telling you, it was amazing. Miss Mary Wise's boys were young, and they were good dancers. We'd get one of these Coast Guard men. They were older and we'd wave for Jack or some of Miss Mary's boys to deliver us. They'd get us going just a back step across the floor and back again and back. 
We call it the Coast Guard Swing, even though these old Coast Guard men didn't know that. They thought they could dance just as good. One old man used to get me going, and I thought he was going to kill himself. I'd wait for Jack to come, and he'd come and tap him on the shoulder, and he'd pick up somebody else. We had more fun going to those dances. We did the Big Apple at the casino. The Big Apple was the most fun of anything in the world. You join in a circle, and you dance. Susie Q and trucking on down. There was all different kinds of steps you had to do. The Susie Q was where you'd go in and out, in and out, and trucking was where you'd shuffle your feet around. It was fun because it was all together in a circle. You were joining in with everybody. So that might be a nice segue to Jennifer's because in many ways that sentiment of Sylvia Culpepper really echoes that everybody helped their neighbor, which we kind of use as a sort of a benediction for the, for the book. So thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that these voices have been meaningful to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Sure, I'm, I'm Rad Tillett, and I was 12, 12 years old when, when they left the, the Nags Head Woods, and we, I used to spend nights with them and stay a lot of, spend a lot of time with them. We always enjoyed just being around the water, swimming down in the, in the uh, sound, and being around the animals. They always had animals, horses, cows, sheep. So it was just a, a lot of fun being on a farm. It was, the house was just a, a farmhouse. It was probably five bedrooms. Bedrooms, the kitchen was off from the house, and the outhouse, and barn and horse tables, so chickens, it was just a, just a good farm. Small one, small, but it was good. The road was just hard to get in and out. Coming around Run Hill was always sandy. So it was just a, a different way to get in every time, it seemed like, to keep from getting stuck. Well, well, the family, I had, I think I had five uncles and five, five aunts, I believe. See, it was a it was a big family, but they weren't all there. There was a lot of them I didn't see for years. Well, swimming, I lo swimming was a good thing, and then riding in the horse cart with my grandfather, that was that was a big thing. We had a horse and cart. That's what he had to transportation here on the beach, so he used that all the time. People told me he built a real good boat for uh, fishing dories on the beach. Just in my lifetime, I remember when there weren't any trees out on the beach. We call it a beach from the sand hills to the ocean. And this morning I was looking, coming down from Kitty Hawk, at all of the grass. Everybody's got grass and lawnmowers going out. And that was an unheard of thing. It was all sand and the, the animals, everybody had animals that run loose on the beach. So they kept it all eat down. There were no trees on the beach. Now there's trees, you know, 50 feet tall probably, pine trees and some oaks. So it's a different, it's just a different place. And now if you don't watch out, instead of getting run over with a horse and cart, it'd be a car run over you. So a little different. Now they were, they were just easy going people. And I think they were really honest people, and that's what I try to be.